everyone. It's Raghu, and I'm here with Bob Thurman. And I'm uh, I'm lucky because uh, we talked to Bob, oh, not too many months ago. And uh, thanks for coming back, Bob. Appreciate it. Well, thank you, Raghu, for having me back. It's a pleasure. Wonderful. So I was, uh, just as we were off line, so to speak, I was just mentioning to Bob some of the uh, the topics that uh, I wanted to discuss with him today. So I'll tell you more about uh, one of the things that happened uh, recently at one of our Maui retreats. And by the way, everybody, Bob is going to be at our Ramdas Krishnadas, Roshi Joan Halifax, Frank Ostaseski Maui retreat, and others, including myself and Duncan Trussell. And it was uh, Duncan Trussell. I'm not that sure. How, if you know Duncan, he's a stand up and uh, has a very popular podcast that he wants to get you on, which you, it would be oh, a, that'd a be delight. Oh, that's yeah. yeah. I, I haven't met him. Yeah, so he was there and we were doing a, we do a live podcast thing, which Bob, we're going to, you'll be part of when, when we go to Maui with Duncan and I. And Sharon oh, okay. was there. And, and so Duncan said, uh, and I've repeated this a few times, so everybody out there, don't, uh, don't get too twirled around the fact that uh, you've heard this story before but Duncan said I mean he was he's really uh, honest and really uh, sincere about uh-huh. wanting to know about practice right. and he says to her well Sharon what do you do in your practice and uh, Sharon goes I get up I sit down <laughs> on my mat and I get real Duncan <laughs> and he was like holy Jesus wait, I wait, wanted that that was in Maui last, uh, you know, about a year ago at one of these I retreats. See, that's so cute. Yeah. So anyhow, I I thought, wow, okay, I love this. I, in, in fact, I went to India in October, and it was in my head the whole time. Which really? is what? What's it all about? Getting real. It's about right. losing the projections and the story we tell ourselves on a day to day basis, right? Yes. That precious I me. It's about yeah. letting go of that. And I, th- I said this to Sharon. Actually, we did something at Deepak Chopra Theater in, in the fall. And I said, you know, Sharon, we got to pursue this getting real thing, uh, get real thing. She said, I think it's more like getting real. I said, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I said, well, you got to write a book about it. Anyhow, but yeah, maybe, you know, we're talking about, you know, the difference between our actual experience and the story we tell ourselves and, yeah. and the projections and the narratives and unadorned experience and so on can you just give us a little bit of your insight around how we uh what that is in terms of that concept and how how you get there i'm thrilled that sharon didn't share that with me but i'm thrilled because i have a slogan over the last few years which to me is like sort of a place i've reached where i you know because people often ask me well tell us in a nutshell uh what is buddhism what is it? You know, like they say, they mm. often say that. And, you know, I've said different things over the years. And what I have said the last five, 10 years is Buddhism is realism. Wow. That's what I say. Really? Yes. That's my primary statement that I make. And Sharon, and then recently Sharon was here and we were doing something. And then we had did a live cast. And then I said that. And then she told me that people on the live cast were getting all exercised about how Buddhism is realism. What does it mean? And they were debating it. It was like a big thing. And she didn't say, well, I call meditating getting real. She didn't say that. So I'm thrilled to hear it. Mm. Uh, I'm thrilled. And uh, the reason I say that is that, uh, you know, the Four Noble Truths that were, is the main framework of Buddha's teaching both Mahayana and uh, Theravada, uh, is, you know, suffering, that the unenlightened life is suffering. It has a cause which you can understand and interfere with. There is a, a freedom from suffering is nirvana. And there's a path to that freedom of suffering. It's like a medical prescription, right? Hmm. Now, the thing that is often not emphasized when people do that is that the third one is the one that is defined as real, nirvana. That's what the reality of the whole thing is. And in Theravada, they don't push that to the extent where they say the reality of this world is nirvana, if you knew what it was. But because you're not knowing what it is, you're experiencing it as a suffering. That's the unenlightened thing. But if you know what it is, you'll know that it's nirvana. 
and they don't push that in the Theravada because they they are sort of saying that there is a place outside of the world, Nirvana, it's what, what we call dualistic Buddhism, in the sense that Nirvana and Samsara are two separate things. The world of suffering you want to get out of, so you get to the world of free of suffering, and that's Nirvana. Whereas in the Mahayana, the universal vehicle, as I call it, um, they push it logically to the point where if Nirvana, since it's the ultimate reality, were separate from this reality, then it would be a relative reality too. It couldn't be an ultimate reality mm -hmm. because it has a boundary between it and this world of suffering. So Mahayana, by pushing that logical thing, and of course, experientially in meditation, insisting on seeing through the illusory nature of the world of I, me, me, mine, versus you and all the others, um, that you can actually still be interconnected with beings in the world and be in the bliss of nirvana, which is the, the, the argument of the Mahayana. So I always like to say that we have a saying in, the, in, the, in our Western culture, ignorance is bliss. Yeah. And we say that because it implies that the reality around us is a pain in the neck. And it's, you know, just will never work out. We have to be resigned to oh, it's going to be frustrating. It's not going to work out. It's going to be like semi-miserable. Now and then we'll have some relief, but that's just the nature of it. So not knowing that is like happiness. But in the case of the Buddha, his discovery was, if you know what this really is, it's bliss. And ignorance is the cause of the suffering. And ignorance is a suffering because you don't know where you are. And you're fighting with things that are not really your problem. And you're not uh, working on things that, that would solve your problem. So that's a, on that basis that the whole movement, educational movement that I consider Buddhism to be, is as is specified in the fourth noble truth of the Eightfold Path, which is also called the Three Educations. Um, uh, being realistic is the best approach because the more well you understand reality, the happier you will be. The less you understand it, the more unnecessary trouble you will put yourself to. So that's why my slogan, when people ask, what is Buddhism? I say, Buddhism is realism. So I love that Sharon, mm -hmm. when she meditates, is getting real, meaning, I guess in her case, She's not breaking it down to some of the techniques like being mindful, watching the breath, or whatever, though she might do all those different things. But what she's doing is seeking a deeper experience of reality or, or, join, or moving to a different experience through the meditative process. And that's getting real. And, I, and uh, what do you know? We've been teaching together for 20 years <laughs> <laughs> in a universe. Actually, I call Theravada and, it's, and the other monastic types of Buddhism, I call them individual vehicle. I don't like the term that some people use. They say lesser vehicle. No, yeah. Although Hinayana can be translated like that, but it's a little bit disparaging and I don't like that. So I call it individual vehicle and, and the Mahayana I call universal vehicle. So it's just a different mode of the, the, the individual vehicle. At least you're getting yourself free. And naturally, you'll be better with others once you do. So then automatically, it will be universal. But the, and the universal vehicle needs every individual to get free. So it shows the mutual interconnectedness of the two. That's yeah. how I like to. So I like to translate Hinayana as uh, individual vehicle and not anything disparaging. Well, um, so let's get down to somebody sitting down and getting real. And yes, as, they, right. as they sit, they can be doing mindfulness exercises, they can be doing uh, vipassana, following the breath, whatever yes. anybody's predilection is that gets them into a place where they've calmed down the monkey mind to a certain extent. And then, yes. and then suddenly, things come up. Yes. And these are the, th the most uh, 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 obvious in terms of the people that I, I, I get mail from and that we talk to at the retreats or wherever we are, yeah. fear and judgment. Yeah. Those are two very, very difficult emotions that uh, really catch people 
even in their getting real practice. So yeah. what what is what of the uh, talk about that and and uh, well, antidotes. you know, there's this thing in the popular mindfulness movement about non-judgmental observe, you know, observing the way your mind is working, counting the breath being a device to try to focus on something, and then notice your mind wandering off it. And this is then giving you a deeper insight into all the distractions that ordinarily go on in the mind. And then learning to take a, to be more uh, dis discerning actually in what trains of thought you allow yourself to have. It's by learning to dismount from trains of thought, to jump off the trains of thought and come back to your counting. So that's a very basic original thing. And the non-judgmental part I think is, is in order to cope with the fear issue. Because when you become more aware of your workings of your mind, everyone has a self-image of themselves, you know, who is who's exploring the meaning of life, who would be therefore such a person as would want to do mindfulness practice, that they have a self-image that they are good persons. I'm a good guy. I'm a good woman. I'm a good person. And when they are things, and they start looking deeper and watching the different processes that are in this immensely complicated thing we have as a mind, they will find some little bit salty thoughts or whatever, <laughs> or especially to use down and dirty thoughts. They will notice in themselves and they'll, that will make them afraid because they will feel that, uh, gee whiz, maybe I'm not so good. Maybe uh, this and that. And also, of course, they will also have thoughts about things that they are afraid of in the world, which maybe one should be like being run over by a bus or something, <laughs> you know, anticipating maybe falling down the street and being run over by a bus. That's good to be afraid of that. So we don't do it. But uh, so that's very good. The non-judgmental initially, however, you know, Vipassana does mean discerning seeing the V part has a sense of uh, penetrating or critical, you know, a v, like a bicycle, like a by, you know, dividing something is what the V relates to. And pasana is just means to see. So seeing by dividing means kind of critical and analytic uh, meditating. So you're observing your mind and then you do actually begin to kind of edit your thinking after a while when you're open to all the different dimensions of your mind through the non-judgmental initial viewing. The, then the practice is to anticipate negative emotions, negative motivations, negative self-perceptions, negative perceptions of others, uh, and also observe the mechanisms whereby we become angry, we become jealous, we become, we become lustful, uh, we become, uh, you know, overly arrogant or something, and, uh, and learn to kind of enter into the gaps of the mental reactivity that produces these, these uh, distressing emotions that cause harm to us and to others in the world. So, and, and that's distinguished from shamatha. I think, unfortunately, some people, when they initially get to the mindfulness because they are so anxious and distraught mentally and stressed out, we all are in our modern society, that they think that vipassana means shamatha, which is the other kind of meditation where you're trying not to think anything and you're trying to develop a one pointedness just to concentrate on one thing without any any extra thought and that's important to be able to do to intensify the critical vipassana part so shamatha and vipassana or samatha i guess in pali and vipassana sanskrit has a little different vipassana and shamatha they have this shas out but otherwise the same word and uh, <clears throat> so so that's the practice that russell what was it russell or russell was asking about and oh, Duncan, think, Duncan. Yeah. yeah, Duncan, Duncan. And what I think Sharon does is she's a very advanced, of course, mindfulness meditator, although she, she's very kind in her teaching how she presents her thought patterns sort of in tune with how other people think, so they'll feel encouraged to try it, you know. Yeah. Uh, but she's very advanced, so I think she probably zooms down in to some deeper space than just counting and just watching some distracting thoughts uh, because of her immense expertise and many and, and 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 long experience of practice meditative practice and so she goes down to where she kind of sees through into a quiet space she sees through into a deeper space and of course she's a very sensitive and emotional person also so she may you know 
try to see different things she got into and tangled up in and try to correct them or to improve her reactions to them and so on. You know, the slogan that comes out of Barry is such a good one about it's not necessarily what what emotions or thoughts you have. It's how you react to them, how you relate to them. That's the fam famous Joseph Goldstein mm. uh, saying that uh, they repeat to great effect and to great benefit, mm. I think. And so she, she does a little of that probably, but I think she goes to a very deep place most likely. But um, who do, how do I know? Yeah, I'm no. not an expert. Yeah, well, uh, one would say that just being with her, and you, you and I have both been with her a lot. Uh, I, but it, 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 getting back to our getting real, yes. it's certainly uh, the, the saying that you just uh, mentioned from uh, Sharon and Joseph's uh, Barry uh, Vipassana Center, IMS, uh, is for everybody listening to me is probably right at the top one or two things to really contemplate in terms of getting real and that sure. is we have it's endemic we are going to have these difficult emotions we have tons of stuff flying at us on a day-to-day -day basis if it's not right. interpersonal it's uh, from watching the news or reading a paper or, right. or hearing about it in, in Starbucks or, or whatever. Right. And, right. and it is more, that is going to go on. There is no end to that. And right. it is really more about, as Joseph indicates, and as you just mentioned, what is your, how is your reaction? What is your reaction time? Right. Can you see how you are reacting and grabbing on right. to each and so the that's why I I by the way Bob I you know we we met Sharon at uh, Vipassana course way back in the day in India we talked about this a little on the last podcast and uh, I am a big proponent personally of that method and of yeah, and, yeah. you know they do anapana at the beginning sh shamatha meditation yeah. one pointed focus and then it, and then after three days. They get more into this body scanning and, and really getting at the, uh, the, the molecular level of what uh, exactly is going yeah. on and, and the yes. and permanent part. So I, I'm a big yeah. advocate of, of Vipassana. And by the way, everybody, Sharon's got a wonderful course. You can go uh, to uh, SharonSalzberg.com and you can find uh, her leading, I think, with uh, Joseph uh, or Jack. The three of them are the, you know, the three wonderful. amigos. Online. Yeah, That's yeah. yeah, so you can find that. Now, the other thing, uh, just last little part of this uh, that interests me, uh, and I don't know where this appear, appears in the Eightfold uh, Path, maybe under right effort, I'm not sure, but cultivating right sincerity. Uh -huh. How can we get more sincere with ourselves? Oh, and that's sincere. really a part of getting real. We're not yes. bullshitting ourselves. Right. Well, uh, you know, the Eightfold Path, and, and by the way, I prefer to translate them also, which, which I, this I didn't invent. I, I got this from Alan Wallace, who you may know, who is a, yeah, a Buddhist a, teacher, yeah. a teacher. And he started a long time ago. I don't think he always does it, but in one context, he wrote realistic worldview, realistic motivation, realistic effort, realistic uh, meditation, this kind of thing. Instead of right and wrong, realistic and un I don't think he ever said unrealistic <laughs> for the opposite but I have used that for years and I much prefer it because it fits with the idea that Buddhism is realism because if Buddha was happy when he became enlightened awakened because he was awakened to what was real around him he got real finally and that made him happy so since since the whole thing is based on the the unusual encouragement for us westerners and actually many Indians too and many Chinese, not just Western thing, that, you know, because authoritarian societies where they have high priests and kings and, or dictators or, or, you know, authorities, they really are not happy to have people think everything is fine. You know, like Ray Charles, it's all right. You know? <laughs> it's all right. You know, they don't really like that. They want people to think it's not really all right and that it can only be all right by going through them going through the synagogue or the church or through this belief system or that uh, that duty or whatever it is, then it'll be all right. But after death, maybe. But it's not all right. And and we are all totally conditioned to be afraid of reality. Like it's, we might fall into hell from the old theism. 
or it's going to be nothing. And then even we tell ourselves we're afraid of nothing, which is actually somewhat highly irrational, but we, we get into it. And uh, so, um, you know, sincerity, I think, comes when you have a realistic worldview where you realize that you are a part, you are a relative continuum entity. You are a relational being that your sense that there's an essential you that somehow is not related to everything, which is the cause of all suffering from Buddha's psychological analysis. But and then that you don't have that and you have a realistic worldview that you're a causal process. And then you get the realistic motivation that you better see to improving the causes because you will get the results of whatever the causes are. And, and then you become very sincere, truthful, honest with yourself, sincere with yourself, which I think is that's yeah. honesty to yourself, not pretending to yourself, this and that, that, not living in denial, sincerity. So I think it comes early right there with realistic motivation, the second of the eightfold path of the four noble truths, the fourth noble truth. And because you get motivated to live as if every minute is your last, as if you have this amazing human opportunity to confront reality and, and, and pierce through, see through illusions. And so that's really what your highest priority is. You may still have a job, you may have to do this and that, you have to go somewhere else, but your highest priority is to evolve in your amazing human multi-optional, not hardwired uh, life form to evolve to a sort of higher reactivity, not just a, a gut reactivity where, you know, eat or be eaten, which is the way the Buddhists describe the suffering of the, the beasts that have less linguistic ability, less intelligence than the human. And, um, and then this is, I thought you, you mentioned earlier, you would th like to talk something about karma, but this connects, I think, very much to karma. Hmm. Because then, you know, the third and fourth uh, bra uh, branches of the Eightfold Path are realistic speech, and realistic karma or action. And th this is what's so interesting. Action for the Indians doesn't just mean, oh, this is Buddhists and Hindus, Vedas, and Jains, all of them. It doesn't just mean physical actions. It doesn't even just mean verbal actions. It does also include verbal actions, which is, and it picks that out and puts that separately, although that's a form of action. But the most powerful action is mental action. So even though you don't kill people all day long or you don't steal stuff from banks, rob banks and things, if your mind is filled with greed of wanting to rob things, if your mind is filled with malicious hostility of wanting to do in this person, that person who you don't like, who you're afraid of, who you think of as that enemy, then you are creating negative karma, which as you, as you may know, I'm a little bit of a renegade amongst my translator friends. I do translate karma as evolution <laughs> or evolutionary action. And I think it's perfectly fits there in our English language, because in English, the biologists and Dar from our biologists and Darwin on, we think of evolution as that which sort of causes our fate. Those who no longer believe that God causes it, at least, especially, they, which is why the creationists don't like Darwin. But we believe that some sort of evolutionary genetic process is controlling us, and that's like the new fate for us. Whereas um, in the Indian world. We are, we have, we're not totally determined. We have freedom of choice. And the key choice we make is in the mind. And that's why they were the ones who really developed yoga in such a huge way. And they have these great meditative traditions of Buddhism and Hinduism and Jainism, et cetera. And, um, and also when Islam came there, Sufism sprung up in India. I don't know if, if, uh, if the people are widely aware of that, but the more meditative guys, the less orthodox types, the Sufis, they yeah. first, the first Sufi in Al Attar's history of the Sufis is the Al Sindhi, the India. And uh, so that's India's great, great knowledge. So the sincerity to yourself, which is honesty, and dropping your pretensions to yourself, which are kind of denials, you know, that's so critical. It comes right at realistic motivation. And then and then you, and that's, and so you, you're scared in a way not to learn to control your mind and not to be aware of how your mind is working because your mind is, your, is working on your fate. That's the thing you have to take care of. It's the mind. 
because it will, it is, the, you know, like one Lama, I know he said this wonderful thing. If you want to know the scientific and technological way to build a nuclear bomb or a hydrogen bomb, you have to start at the beginning, which is the mind of hatred of the enemy. Mm. So the hateful mind, the mind that hates, is the beginning of the construction of the nuclear weapon. It is the first component, and it's what causes the trigger. It what fires it also is the mind of hate. So that's immense. Even though you might be, I might have a momentary thing like, oh, I don't like somebody who I have to see on television every day, <laughs> who shall be unnamed. Although there's a great children's book that I just read to my granddaughter a few days ago that my daughter showed me. And I was asked to read it to my granddaughter, and she loved it. And it's called, she already knew it by heart, practically. It's called about the Trumpus Americanus. <laughs> You're kidding. <laughs> really, like a kind of fearsome little troglodyte that runs around and makes noises and does weird things, orange colored. You know, it's like a really <laughs> cute kid's book about uh, the trumpets and not to be bothered by the trumpets. And the best way of being safe from the trumpets is to turn off the TV. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Anyway, never mind. So I'm saying, even though we're being nice and all that, having a nice time, then we our mind goes there, and then we think, we, oh, we don't want to get rid of that thing. Or it could be someone else. I mean, it could be someone in history, like Genghis Khan or Hitler or someone we think we're justified in hating. Then our mind goes into killer mode. And then sadly, the power of that subtle energy of a mental thought will determine our fate in this life and in future lives. And of course, that's really important in all the Indic traditions. You know, I don't care what modern modern Buddhists talk about or what they say. Hey, you know, they really, really have to get real if they really care about what Buddha had to say. Because as you know, under the Bodhi tree, you know, he 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 remembered infinite previous lives of himself and others before he uh, he realized the Nirvana. You know? And I think he was able to remember them because he was on the event horizon of Nirvana. And therefore, he was seeing reality even in the past, even when he thought he had been suffering. He was seeing that as never, not outside being enfolded in the, in the reality of love and bliss, which is nirvana. You know? So anyway, but that's a pet thing of mine, but I won't go into that. But my point is karma is mental karma, and that's why you, you get real. Then if you put it in, in, in the realistic effort, which is the sixth one, after the ethics, after the wisdom, the ethics, Wisdom, higher education, ethics, higher education. Then effort begins the meditational or, or psychological higher education. And that effort means you start to put your effort into the reality of your life, which is what your mind is doing to you. Mm. Instead of putting every, oh, what so-and-so did to me, what the police did to me, what, the, what my friend did to me, what my ex did to me, what my parents did to me. Instead of that, what is my mind doing to me? And where is my mind taking me? And all this uncontrolled reactivity in my mind. And putting your creativity into finding out what that is and trying to ameliorate, make that a little better. Be mindful of what's negative and what's positive and reinforce the positive and de-emphasize the negative. Baby step by baby step in the immortal terms of words of Bill Murray, my <laughs> one of my Buddhist gurus, <laughs> so baby step by baby step, we our mind gets better, and then it has a better karma. And and the deeper we go, the more sincere with ourselves we are and honest we are. Then we we it moves into the seventh, uh, seventh uh, uh, branch of the noble eightfold path, which is the branch of mindfulness or remembering, and remembering what is going on now. At the root place for each person is in their own mind. Right. And yeah. so th and that's that's what I would say. Is well, that helpful? Yeah, no, that's a, a great roundup of, get, of getting real and bringing in. I mean, some of this stuff. Uh, what happened to me? I mean, it's just yes. making me think about how this all came about for me. I don't know if you know. Robert Svoboda, he wrote these great books. Sure, on, I do. Yeah. I, personally, I don't know if I, I have met him, I think, but I don't know him well. But He's a wonderful he, he man. A, he is a, a very interesting and wonderful guy with the Agorikas, his yeah, work with, yeah, with the Agora, Agorika sadhus yeah. and so on. Yeah, yeah well, with this particular one named Vimalananda. And uh, so we did a podcast last fall, 
And uh-huh. his third book is around the law of karma. And uh-huh. so we had a grand discussion around that uh, from uh, the Agora point of view. Uh, oh, cool. and, and that book, I don't know if you've read that, but that was one no. of the most edifying books around that subject that I had oh, ever... Oh, I must look it up. Yeah, I'll, no, I'll you absolutely it. should. But a- as we went through it, we got to the point where you just... Uh, the same thing that you were just talking about, the subtlety of the thought forms that yes. you create yes. in reactivity to yes. to stuff or or out of desire out of attachment and the resultant karmas that are created yes. uh, you know people think okay you know you're going to smack someone in the head they're going to smack you back karma yeah. no this is way beyond that and it goes uh it goes a long long way to um, really the the reality uh, yes and I love, by the way, what you're talking about. Instead of right effort, realistic effort in yeah, the eight. Yeah, well, I give path. the I give uh, credit to to uh, Alan on that. Right, to Alan Wallace on that. I, I saw that, and it just hit me. That's the right thing, you know. Yeah. Uh, Often I argue with Alan about other things, but oh, that one <laughs> I really, I really liked it. Uh, and I, I use it maybe even more than he does now. I don't know. I don't know how he if he uses it everywhere, but I do. Oh, it's beautiful. You uh, know, right and wrong is sort of in the line of following a rule. Oh, you're right because that was the rule, and you're wrong because you didn't follow a yeah. rule. It relates to kind of the authoritarian social cultural pattern of our Western society, where you're where God on high has given rules, you know, and you must follow them to be right or wrong. But and so they naturally the early translators pro- projected that into into Buddhism, whereas in Buddhism ethical action is real. And therefore benefits you because it gets you it's it's dealing with what the situation you're really in or it's unreal in the sense of it's creating you into some artificial attempt to escape from what's really going on which actually you think you're getting away from problems but you're making your problem worse so you're 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 creating your own effects it's and you're more responsible for your own effects so that's why i really love that realistic yeah. and unrealistic idea. here's something uh i want to yeah. read to you actions affect both doers and those around them in yes. unimaginable ways. And yes. the seeds of karma shape our lives and our worlds, though, and this is the interesting thing, different Buddhist traditions, I believe Joseph Goldstein wrote this, give different weight to whether the action is willed or not. In either case, yes. through mindfulness, yes. we can become aware of the nature of these actions and can, in fact, change our karma, the concept of cause and effect. But, right. but wait to whether the action is willed or not. What, what do you, what's your reaction? Oh, that's, to? A, that's a very important point and very correct. And it is, I don't know if it's a different kinds of Buddhism. I don't know any kind of Buddhism that doesn't define karma, what, I, what I'm saying, evolutionary action. That means action that has an evolutionary impact in the sense that it affects your embodiment, your, your life, your speech, your experiences in the future. So you and you never stay still. You got to go up or down in in, the, in your quality of experience and quality of life, and uh, and so it, in order for action to be evolutionary, it has to be intentional action. Chetana, you know, it's the word is chetana, and um, you know, a willed action, in the sense of you decided that, so you're responsible for it. You know, you're motivated to do it, so you're responsible for it. So the, the, the locus of control of your world is your mind. Your, it, it, Buddha was the first rebel against uh, authoritarian religion. And uh, people don't normally know this. Karma before Buddha's time, and I'm not saying he, he, he uniquely did this. There were other sages who were in the ballpark with him, I'm sure, at the time. Mm. But he's the one who's most known for it. And that is that karma meant a ritual action. And, and the word samskara, which is the second branch of the 12 links in Buddhism, and also the word karma, both of those words are words in the brahmanas for ritual activities. And ritual activities are the ones that are powerful in determining your fate if you think your fate is controlled by gods. And the rituals are offerings to propitiate the gods and, yes, give me victory, give me progeny, give me wealth, give me security, whatever you want from the gods, getting favors. You're bartering with the gods through the ritual to have a good fate because you think they control you. So Buddha's, in Buddha's time anyway, and I think Buddha himself, is the one who rejected that. And he told his father, 
when his father said he was being impractical trying to attain enlightenment, he should just be a king and take care of society. And he said, Buddha said, well, but people's problems are not mainly their social problems. They are their problems of birth, death, sickness, old age, and death, you know. And then he said, oh, you can't help them with that. The priests are doing it. The gods take care of that. And then Buddha said, well, they're doing a crappy job. <laughs> and I think I can do better. I think we can do better. And so he rebelled against that. And he created this sort of secular ethic like the Lama talks about today. But in those times, karma, evolutionary action, was a secular ethic because he was saying, what you think in your mind is what brings you happiness or unhappiness, like in the Dhammapada, you know? Happiness follows a bad mind, or a good mind, like the wheel follows the hoof of the ox pulling the cart. And, and unhappiness and misery follows the bad mind like the wheel follows the hoof, right? That's sort of absolutely seminal in Buddha's insight. And, but that was not the way it always was in India in his time, not at all. In the Vedic thing, they would sacrifice even animals, which Buddha was very much against. Because that's a, you know the gods wanted a burger or something. The gods wanted a barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> they thought because they were kind of warlike, fearsome gods. But uh, the Vedic gods were no sweet, cute Krishna in those days. And uh, so, so this is uh, and we you know people constantly go around. Oh my karma! Like it was a fate following them. You know they misuse the word karma like that. Oh, that's your karma, like. It's some deterministic thing because we're used to, you know, when we gave up being controlled by God, I'm, when I say we, I mean the people in the culture, then they got into being controlled by their genes, you know, controlled by their unconscious, controlled by their social situation, you know, Darwin, Marx, and Freud, <laughs> the three great prophets of modern secularism, you know. So they still, they feel helpless. People feel helpless. Buddha wants you to get real and take responsibility. For your mind and that's why those societies supported people and they considered for example an education like delivered by columbia or harvard university sucks because they don't directly teach you to control your mind you know vipassana and shamatha should be core curriculum courses in decent liberal arts universities because it's not i mean indirectly by having to learn a language or memorize a formula or you know, do something like that. You get more concentration, and your mind improves as an instrument. But you 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 don't look into your emotions and your reactions. You're not taught to do that, except maybe yeah. in humanities courses. You read literature, and you see some guy who had a bad temper, or have a bad thing happen to him, and you you try not to imitate that. So indirectly, there's there's a lot of moral reinforcement. But they will not discuss ethics. Basically, they will not discuss. Uh, the quality of your mind as an instrument, the instrument with which you learn, with which you experience, with which you do things, they don't help you with that. And that sucks yeah. totally. Yeah. And, uh, and, it's, and it's really a kind of denial on the part of the, of uh, the great billion dollar educational industry that they are responsible for helping students learn to control their minds. Yeah. Bob, maybe you need to have a chat with Betsy DeVos uh, after this podcast. I would perhaps. love to. <laughs> <laughs> I would. That would give me a, a lot of a lot of practice in controlling my reactivity. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I might fail a little bit, but uh, but I wouldn't fail too much because you know her brother has a private army in North Carolina in the woods there, so I, I wouldn't be too oh, too God. critical. Of her. Uh, Eric Prince, you know, that's her brother, you know, yeah, yeah, okay. the guy with the, that army, you know. Yeah, uh, I'm in North Tracker. Carolina, so I'm getting a ticket uh -oh. to get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! Uh, so okay. the the Buddha, and and here we're 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 getting to the core of the real joint relationship of of my of Sharon's premise of getting real and karma yes. i think we're the, they're so, so. part well, of you each know, other in the realistic worldview the first branch the realistic worldview where you have to develop your wisdom of through learning critical meditation or discursive meditation you know and then finally meditate you know pointed focused meditation those three stages uh, the main thing is you don't have to believe in buddha you don't have to believe in gods or you don't have to believe any particular thing, but you have to believe in causality. That's the key thing. Causality is the key thing. And that's so interesting because why is causality the key thing? Because 
our problem comes because we feel we have an essential self that is beyond causality. This is our wrong wiring according to Buddhist psychology. And it make, gives us that rigidness and therefore we have a sort of rigid self-image and we have a rigid this and then we rigid that. And then even we try to go into escape states, meditative escape states where we will be disconnected from reality. And some people will even define that as liberation, but mm -hmm. not Buddha, not Buddha. He taught the four formless states as being not Nirvana, although very stable and extremely quietistic states infinite space, infinite consciousness, nothingness even. You can go and jump into Carl Sagan's nothingness or Unamuno, existential nothingness, and then beyond consciousness and unconsciousness. And he clearly said that those four states, while something that adept yogis can attain, they should know ahead of time, they're still relational states because you enter them through certain expertise, through certain cultivation, certain practice, and you exit them eventually sooner although it might if you're lured into them thinking that's ultimate reality you might become a deity of the formless realm a bodiless deity for aeons actually they 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 warn you know but i don't know they tend to exaggerate a little bit i think <laughs> but anyway you might get stuck there and the point is uh uh causality if you if you if you have to sort of adopt a realistic worldview that you are a causal process and that Everything relative is relative. And that is the encounter, of course, with emptiness, because emptiness means every relative thing is empty of any non-relative, non-causal element. That's all that emptiness means. It doesn't mean emptiness is a place that's empty. It means every causal process is, happens because each relative thing is only relative and therefore only interconnected. And that's what we are. So... So, so that's, and then once you accept causality, then it's like the second law of thermodynamics, spiritual thermodynamics. You cannot become nothing. No fear, no death. We're going to get into that. You know, you can't be nothing because no energy is ever destroyed. It only changes form. Hmm. And our minds are energy, very, very subtle energy, but they are energy because we know that because they affect the motions of our body, the motions of our speech. They affect things, you know, what the, the actions that we do, the consequences of what we think. And so we know that they are energy because they interact causally and effectively, effectually with other uh, things that we can see are energy. Yeah. So, so although I ran into a really weird thing, actually, huh? recently, I'm so ignorant, I have to admit, I'm a really ignorant person. I never, I know, I, I was so ordered at one time by my guru, I should study a lot of physics, but I never did really, except, you know, popular physics, you know, I didn't really get into the ABC of it, although I was really good at math, but I just didn't do it. I don't know why. But I found this out. I was looking up in a kind of dictionary. And did you know this? Energy has no mass. But of course, I knew that, but I just wasn't paying attention. You know, E equals to MC C squared. squared. M is mass. C squared is, twi is the speed of light squared, right? A huge number. So energy is the speed of light squared, but then once it's, once you blow up matter with the speed of light squaring it, energy itself has no mass. Hmm. Now, the reason that blew my mind is that these materialist scientists who talk with the lamas, you know, yeah. and with the Dalai Lama, yeah. they go on and on about, well, your holiness, yes, we'll try to think that the mind exists, like as you say, but it's really hard for us because, you know, it's not matter. So how can it matter? How can it affect matter? And you know, you just know in their mind, they have this image subliminally of little billiard boards banging one into another, you know, matter banging on matter, you know, some 19th century or 18th century notion of little atoms banging into each other. You know, that's what they have. That's in their mind. And so how can something like mind, which isn't matter, affect matter? But I, then let's, how about, how can energy has no mass? It doesn't, it can't bang into any billiard ball. It has no mass. So how come that's not a problem for them? <laughs> you follow me? Yeah. That's all, but it's just because it's the word energy. Oh, yeah, energy. <laughs> Meanwhile, it has no mass. That's why they were so excited two years ago in the summer when they had these different things blow up in the cyclotron and they saw a Higgs boson, they think. Well, they saw yeah, trace. Right they never saw any Higgs boson. They just traces from the different statistical thing about the explosions. You know, they inferred the existence of a Higgs boson, and then they quickly backtracked and said, "Well, 
but 97% of the, of the universe is dark, so we haven't seen it yet. <laughs> mm. I mean, those guys are really out there in, in sort of abstruse theology. I'm sorry. They really are. Mm. They're great people. I love them. I love scientists. Buddha was a scientist. You know, when Sharon is a scientist, when she's getting real, sitting on her cushion. But she's, used, she's using the inner microscope and telescope, and she's going into this mm. vast, huge, amazing massless but energetic thing which is the mind yeah and that's really back to square one where we started this whole conversation yeah that uh, inner <laughs> education is really what everybody that's what we are talking about yeah nothing esoteric she's talking yes. about sitting down and looking inside herself that's right inside yeah. ourselves yeah, and, you can't be educated just looking all outside the world. Yeah, and then I mean, things happen to you, and you blame this and that outside person, We're celebrating your powerlessness to do anything, and making yourself more and more depressed. The one thing you can do something about is your mind, because that's you, and it's a continuum, and it always changes, and you're free to choose, be a pain and be nice, you know, hmm. love everyone or hate everyone. You can you can choose. And, you'll, and it will affect your blood pressure and your circulatory system and the way other people relate to you and your experience of life, everything. And so how can you consider yourself educated if you have no mastery of your own mind? Yeah, it's just, exactly. it, it shows that we are not an advanced culture. We're a backward culture. That you can go to Harvard and you think, oh, I went to Harvard, I'm practically a god. You know? And yet you have no idea about your mind. That's why I left Harvard in 1961 I left it because they, nobody taught me what I was calling in those days a yoga of the emotions. And my own emotions were very passionate and crazy, you know, like on and off, you know, and up and down. I was pretty giddy with, with, with elation often. <laughs> and then I would get freaked out, and, you know, and I, I was pretty jolly in a way. But, but you know, uh, I, it was like I was under the control of some inner thing. You know, you, people get upset. We don't want to be under control of the Congress, of the Republicans, of the Democrats, of the this and the that, of the Nazis, of the liberals. We don't want to be under the control of all these people or my parents. But we just don't mind that we're told that there's nothing we can do about being uncontrolled, not in control of our mind. Mm -hmm. So we just don't mind being bossed around by this, this these rampant emotions yeah. that bring us a lot of grief and yeah. other people, too. Yeah. So anyway, anyway, that's 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 getting real. I think really. Yeah. No. But I think and uh, one thing. One thing. I, can yeah. I say one thing in the, in yeah, the Buddhist absolutely. context? You know, this is a problem a little bit about the modern way Buddhism is understood and taught because of the cultural arrogance of us Westerners, because we think we have the most advanced culture rather than a backward one who don't even teach mindfulness, but in, in school in high priced college. But because of that, the three higher education, the Sanskrit word is Adi Shiksha. Pali is Adi Sikha. And that word Sik Shiksha means education. The Department of Education in India is the Shiksha Department. Even today. <laughs> <laughs> and the point is, everyone has to translate as training. Training. The three trainings. So everybody naturally thinks, oh, Buddhism, I'll go get trained. So well, there's some training in education, of course. You have to train to speak French. You have to train to meditate. There's some training in there. But education, it means you have to learn. It brings, brings out your inner wisdom. It brings out your inner alertness. It brings out your inner kindness, your, your, you know, your inner sincerity. Right? And so, so uh, that's, a, that's a, low, a much different process than training. Training assumes a passive recipient of the training. You train the dog, you, know, you train a horse, you train your hair. You know, it doesn't assume that you're evoking the intelligence of the person who's trying to get real or you're trying to help mm. getting real, for example. Great point. Great so, point. So, so that's why I'm, again, causing ripples in the translator world you know, by insisting that these are three educations. And, and Adi means intense or higher, or repeating, you know? So I like to say super education. Since we don't get that education in our schools, we, we don't get that, especially the mind, the samadhi, the smriti, the mindfulness, and the uh, education. 
we need these super educations. Yeah. Evoking our creativity. I love yes. that. That is yes. so right on. We we have to actually talk about one other thing in all okay, of this. Sure. When we're talking about getting real, we're talking about the wisdom of karma. Uh, yes. We have to talk a little bit about reincarnation, and uh, sure. which is a difficult thing for Westerners in general. Um, and let me read you a little something from uh, Robert uh, Svoboda's book, uh, The Law of oh, Karma. Good. Your progress in each life is fertilized and watered by the karmic reactions that support you and is interfered with by karmas that act against your interests. Uh -huh. Finally, your terminating karmas catch up with you and kill you. The thought you think at the moment of death, a thought which will reflect either the force of the strongest karmas you perform during that lifetime or your state of mind as you lie dying, or the force of your habits, or whatever reaction has just matured to join your karmic cue, sets you up for your next birth. That's very oh, good. Oh, jeez. I like that. Oh, and that's geez. why in Buddhist societies and Hindu societies and Jain societies, people pray to die peacefully at home or in you know surrounded by loved ones or in or in, at least in a quiet place and uh, not in battle or in an accident or in some sort of very emotionally disturbed type of situation so they can actually compose their mind and put it in focus and think of what's really real and try to be more loving and forgive everybody and be forgiven and this kind of thing that that's the reason but but there is one consolation there about that when he because he said the thought that's in your mind Mm. And yes, but uh, there it is a beautiful thing in Buddhist and I think also in Hindu psychology too, uh, which is that um, there's different layers of the mind. And the one that goes along, the stream that goes along continuously is, is not necessarily the, the superficial, what, what I would call meat space, brain, normal relational thinking where we're thinking in terms of uh, concepts and words in our, in our thing, there's like a more seminal continuum, which is sort of like, actually they use the word gotra in, in some contexts in Buddhist uh, thought, um, where they, which, is, which is related to clan, and it's like the word gene in English, which relates to gens, which means a clan or a tribe in Latin and Greek, genos in Greek. And um, they use this word gotra. And so that's a subtle process because the, the brain-oriented thinking uh, that we do in meat space is sort of left when we leave meat space in the death process. And, and so sometimes even if you're in a disturbed state, people shouldn't feel bad if, some, if one of their loved ones dies in an accident or in some bad mood or in some fr frightened seeing situation. Because if they are mainstream living and mainstream mindfulness and meditating and sort of being real about themselves and, and, and self-sincerity, honesty, uh, has been long-term open-minded and long-term generous and long-term loving and friendly and so on, then the deeper subtle mind will just toss off the bad mood, the surface bad mood of the bad experience, hmm. if you follow me. Wow. So, so this means that while there is an important thing about the circumstance of death for sure, uh, people shouldn't feel bad in case they, someone they know or love goes out in a bad scene because if that person has been living well, there's a longer term cultivating of a sort of, let's call it a soul gene. I know that's a big, big heresy. Oh, no, Ram Dass oh, is going to no, love you. Jiva, oh, no, 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 Atma, Jiva. It's not supposed to mention, but actually that's just fake. That, again, is a thing about translators. Mm. You know, sure, Buddha said there's no Atma. And he said, there's no jiva. And he said, there's no this and that at different times. Because all he, but all he ever meant was no fixed, absolute, unrelated thing that's really you. Because any unrelated thing relating to you would be irrelevant to you because it couldn't relate to you. So he also said, there's no nose. There's no ear, no eye, no aggregate. You know, he, he said when he was in his no mood, everything was no. When he was in his yes mood, as, a, as when he's dealing with people as relational processes, then there can be subtle process too. 
you know, so, you know, they have, you know, soul food. You have soul food. It's not an absolute food. It's like delicious food. You eat it and consume it, you know, and it gets digested. And so we, why should we be, be barred from use of that word? Because some 19th century translator was rebelling against Christianity and having a soul that the church owned or the, or the synagogue the rabbi owned or the, the, the mosque, the mullah owned, again, rebelling against theisms. And they therefore wanted to not have a soul it's because they wanted to be just relative beings, you know, and they, and they picked on that particular part, that subtle part of their being as the one they didn't have. But, uh, and so they, when they saw anatma in Buddhism or ajiva, they got all excited. Oh, here we have a tradition and they don't have any soul, et cetera. And then of course, people freak out because they say, well, if there's no subtle, subtle process as well as the course process, since we see the course process ending at death, what is it that goes on beyond death in rebirth? Mm. And, and the point is, in the psychology, more or less developed both in esoteric Hinduism, tantric Hinduism, and tantric Buddhism, there is this subtle process. And, uh, and, uh, and that's the one that, that is shaped slowly and gradually, baby step, by getting real and being real. And being real also means being open, being resilient, being flexible, being kind, not getting angry at, over injury, et cetera, et cetera. That's what getting real. That's what getting real really is, you know. I think. You know? Oh, uh, so, yeah. so anyway, but also, also another thing is, when you're driven to be reborn by that mind that is in control of you instead of the one that you're in control of, then that we call that rebirth. Reincarnation is when you are not driven by such an unconscious mind, but you choose to be reborn to to still help and be be there with your loved ones and or and or with new loved ones or whatever you know in other words you you choose to come back so we save reincarnation for that like an avatar you know hinduism or a nirmanakaya you know in buddhism toku in tibet you know yeah we save it like that and and you know it's you said one thing you said you said it was difficult for us well that's only because we're not used to it we're used to a narrative that that imports absolutes into everything but there was the absolute God sitting up there, ha ha, you know, makes the world, but he's not affected by it. So he's so then it's a, the total irrational thing of an absolute relative thing. How can you create something and not be connected to it yeah. without connecting to it? Of course, you have to connect to it to create it. <clears throat> and so we, anyway, we got used to that kind of irrational thing. So then when we dumped that, we got into the idea that there's an absolute nothingness that we're going to. And we're used to that and we think that's intuitive. But actually, that is very difficult to, if you think about it, if you want to be practical, commonsensical, and scientific, because the one thing that will never be evidenced and will never be discovered, even by super mega Einstein or Stephen Hawking or anybody, is nothing. We know ahead of time they're never going to find that. And there's no evidence that that exists. And even in common sense, it's a word for something that doesn't exist. So therefore, it's not a place that anybody can go. It's not possible. So it's blind faith, of totally, to think that, uh, which people do when they die. When people who are all, my grandfather was a convinced materialist. And when between 92 and 96 or seven, he started hedging his bets. <laughs> and he was much nicer. He was like, maybe there's a consequence to how I am, you know, my state of being, and I better work on it, and I'll support my young grandson to be a Buddhist monk, and all this kind of thing, which he never would have thought of ever if, if we hadn't discussed it. And he began to realize that the security that I'm going to be nothing is it's a blind faith, because no one can ever prove it. No one will ever discover it. You know, if people wait, and so it's, you remember Pascal's thing, you know, in the context of Christian theism, you know, he said, well, if I'm not going to exist after death and there is no God, then I won't regret that I didn't think so. <laughs> <laughs> but if there is a God or there is a God and there's some consequence for how I've lived, then I'll deeply regret if I acted like there'll be no consequence. Yeah. Right. And so I'll, I'll, you know, it's a, it's a win-win to make some preparation for the beyond, you know. Mm. Whatever, whatever our habitual thinking is, you know, mm. it's a win-win. Yeah. There's no loss for the other side, yeah. and um, and so, you know, I always recommend to people who who get kind of interested in it, but they say it's so hard for me, so hard for me. Although I must say this, 
I find that happening much less nowadays because there are films about being, people being reborn. There's a lot of movement in the culture, near-death experiences, yeah. yep, people especially. attending on people who die and feeling their presence when the body has stopped. And it's happening in the culture, and so it's not as difficult for as many people as it used to be. Yep. But it's still there. And so I urge them to read the Jataka tales, you know, the Buddha's former life stories that he recounts to people, and read literature like or like the uh, Yoga Vashishta, a Hinduism one, about multiple live things that go on, you know, the wonderful mm -hmm. Yoga Vashishta. Uh, some, Deepak really likes that Yoga Vashishta yeah, thing. Yeah. And it's very magical and interesting. And... Um, you know, read literature from India where it, it's like matter of fact and, and realize that for people in, uh, who develop that kind of common sense or are not trapped in a, in a materialistic culture that thinks it's so advanced and is actually so uh, simplistic in some respect, yeah. um, then they just get used to the idea of the thing. We're just not used to, you know, familiarity helps you then begins to expand your sense of common sense. Yeah. You know? and yeah. That, and that can happen to people. I think. Yeah. No, like, like, for example, you're in North Carolina. Yeah. You say, but to me, you're a picture on the screen, you know? So I, but I believe North Carolina exists. I can't see it. I have no, it's not visible to me. I actually used to spend summers in Chapel Hill. Actually, <laughs> personally, I have a little Tar Hill connection for, as a New Yorker, kind of fake Tar Hill thing. But you know, that's just my common sense. It's not, I don't consider it a mystical view that North Carolina is still there and that you were there sitting there in North Carolina. Where are you in North Carolina? You told me, but I forgot. Asheville. Asheville oh, up in the hills. Just, that's yeah, really lovely. It's beautiful. Lovely. Yeah. A little bit colder. Yes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's very cold. Yeah. So, <laughs> but beautiful. The blue, yeah. blue mountains. The Blue Ridge Mountains. Yeah. So, uh, I want to circle back to just put a cap okay. on, on our whole chat here. Because you, a few minutes ago, as you were talking about uh, reincarnation and, and what it is that moves yes. on, yes, we talked. You talked about the qualities of realistic, being real, getting real. Right. What right. are the qualities? Kindness, compassion. Right. right. Interconnectivity. I, I mean, right. there's a whole. We can go on and on, but I have to say. Uh, my own experience and of of our mutual uh, friend Ramdas is uh, after I followed him back and because I was like he kept talking about this being that was just absolutely blew his mind beyond any acid that he ever took and uh, exactly so yeah, Swamiji so, Rab Maharaji the Maharaji so yes Maharaji what, yes so their terms of a being that was living completely in reality. I mean, that's absolutely, a, absolutely in reality. Mm -hmm. And 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 what was that? M the most distinguishing uh, makeup of that reality for me and for Ramdas, who repeats it over and over, is unconditional love. There was somebody. Right. There was no looking for anything. Right. There was just in that. There was no object or right. subject. There was no I. Right. There was that's no the highest one. Yeah. And it's called non-referential love or yeah. non-objectifying love. Exactly. And then within all of that was you'd look, you know, he not a lot would he just capture your gaze because, you know, the, the amount of energy that was involved was, was more than our little guys there, 20 year olds, odd goes, guys could take, guys and girls, <laughs> uh, but empty. And Ramdas once recently, I tell this story a million times. He was he got into talking about Maharaji, and he got just into that love place of of just f completely being overwhelmed in the moment That's by so it. Wonderful. And to, wonderful. he was just, and then, you know what he kept repeating over and over when he got into that place, he could only say one thing: what? he was he's totally empty, just empty, totally empty. empty. Oh, great! Empty. Really? And, that, and I always refer to that when I talk to. Uh, to all my Buddhist friends, I talk about the fact that that quality is the quality of of the fullness of this, as you call it, non-referential love. Yeah, it could only come from that place. Yes, it could Absolutely. only come, and that. Because, because, but, but what that is, then people shouldn't wrongly think that that means that he's he's like he is an empty space. No, the that, opposite. It means that he's a Totally relational being. Yeah. It's what it means. Yeah, exactly. So that means that he's he's empty of any any 
being he's not full of himself. Right. And himself that's why is gone. he's so loving. He's perceived overwhelmingly loving, perceived as overwhelmingly loving, is overwhelmingly loving to Ramdas. Yeah. And right? all of us. So yeah. when he says empty, you know, it's a, you're making me think of something. I often wonder, well, but to me, it's a proof of previous life, actually. When I first met my first teacher, who Ramdas also knew, who's even in V here now, Geshe Wangel, the yeah, Geshe old Wangel, Mongolian, yeah. in New Jersey. Um, he, you know, I met him one tea time for about two hours or hour and a half. And I was, I had a return ticket to Delhi. The two, a flight was booked for two days after that. And I sold that ticket and I immediately, and as I was leaving his, his, his little funny tract house slash Buddhist temple, going down this front walk, concrete front walk. I told my friend who had driven me there, who was not so much into it, hadn't been to India as I had just been. And I said, that's my teacher. I'm, that's, oh, he's the one. So, oh, I got it. It's like karma or whatever. I don't know what I said. But I said, I said, that's my teacher. I'm coming back tomorrow. And he said, what? That little guy? What are you talking about? You know, when you're going back to India two days. What, what, what? You know, he was all baffled. And he said, why, why do you think? I said, well, I can trust him, I said. You know, I really could. I know I can trust him. Well, why do you think so? You just had a cup of tea with the guy and, and et cetera. We barely talked with him. And I said, he said, he said, why? What makes you you can trust him? I said, because he's not there. Mm -hmm. I said, just blurted it out. And I realized so many years later, of course, I had no idea what I meant, really. <laughs> it was an intuitive thing. Mm -hmm. From previous life interaction with that man, and because he was in the same mm. ballpark as Maharaji, yeah, and I was too stupid when I was in the same province as Maharaji on the same road going by mm -hmm. his center mm -hmm. to go see him mm -hmm. to stop my car with all my kids and driving hippies back and forth to the hospital in Nanital. I was too my bone bad karma. I didn't get out of the car and go across the bridge and go and sit down with that guy in the blanket with those guys with the white things sitting around, which might have been you, probably. Probably, yeah. Probably. No, 70, I even know. There's Danny Goldman. Yeah, Danny Goldman said, oh, there's Bob in his car. He's going by. Hi, Bob. He's ah! waving. Okay. <laughs> I can't believe it. You know, I just was so stupid. Oh, oh, I can't believe well, it. Well, I guess But anyway, you, point is, you know, and, and, and I love another thing about Maharaji that Ramdas tells a story where he says when, because I was very upset that summer too about Bangladesh, mm, yeah. because in the Indian press, you got a lot of direct knowledge and pictures of the atrocities, you know, you know, when Paul Harrison, George Harrison made his concert with Ravi Shankar yeah, about yeah. Bangladesh and yeah. my friend and all that, you know, we, American people didn't really know what awful stuff went on back by Nixon and Kissinger and stuff and, uh, and West Pakistan in the Bengalis. And he's, it was really, really bad. So Ramdas was very upset about it. And so he went to Maharaji. He said this. He said, it's so horrible over there. What, what, what about that, Maharaji? Something like that. No, he Maharaji, said, he said, Bob, I want to take my bus and go over there and I want to help. I can use it as an ambulance. Exactly. Some, you're right. So then, well, it, well, I, that, yeah, but in the, in the version, he didn't emphasize that in the version. He just emphasized it was so horrible, and he wanted to get Maharaji to acknowledge that. And Maharaji said, oh, but can't you see? It's perfect. Hmm. Maharaji. And then he's then obviously Ramdas hated that, as did I, when I heard it. And first, you know, 40 years ago. And then uh, he said, my, I, Ramdas won my heart when he said he reported that he said yes, it's perfect, but it stinks. Yeah, right, exactly. He said, and I love that. But you know what? I, I wanted to praise Maharaji for that because, see, he's he was more real than Ramdas yet was at that time. And there, the reality of everything, even everybody gets killed, even it's horrible, even a lot of things go wrong. Even the Death Star comes and blows up seven billion people on the planet and everything. You know, they, nobody dies. They get reborn somewhere. If they have nice, loving minds, they find beautiful, loving places to be born. If they have angry minds, they're going to have trouble. But they, but they go. You know, it's just another. It's a more dramatic, drastic, and horrible change. Yes, 
and human life is extremely precious and we should do everything. We should drive ambulances and do things like that. But you know, we would drive the ambulances much better if we could not be freaked out in a certain way where we would, we would even, you know, we would see the deeper reality of everything. Love is the more powerful energy, even though there's a hellish kind of hatred and horrible violence going on to people not knowing what they're doing in some crazy way, mm. which, is, which is the other side. You know, it's like a, an enlightened person like Maharaji, a Buddha like Maharaji, he would see the atrocities as truly horrible. And if he thought Ram Dass was a good ambulance driver, he would have sent him over. <laughs> uh, but instead of he would be machine gunned immediately, no doubt by Kissinger's proxies, the West Pakistanis. But, you know, on the other hand, he sees the illusory quality, not a complete illusion. It's really, it, it's relatively real means re also real. And it's terribly real for those who are suffering and caught up in the ignorance of thinking it's the only reality. But the deeper reality is like this mirror. When you see the thing, it's like a reflection in a mirror. And the mirror is where love is the infinite energy that makes everything yeah. perfect. Yeah. And he never, a, a man like that, a being like that, has both of those sides that we yeah. aspire to. So they right. simultaneously see the love. They're empty enough to see the love even in the midst of being deeply concerned and compassionate about the horror, yeah. but also very, and that it keeps them cool about the horror in a certain way where they can intersect with it then trying to try to stop it or ameliorate it much more effectively without hating the perpetrators, without getting all worked right. up and horrify, horrific themselves. Right. And be stay total, you know, that, that makes them more effective. Yeah. And by the way, Ramdas, these days, we've actually had talked about this more than once at these retreats. We'll have to bring it up, Bob. Oh, in this good. No, I'm going to remember that going we're going to do that. that. Yeah, but what I he do. says now, remember, he says, yes. I did not say that because I am not living that. He said it. He is living. It is all perfect. I am not living. It is all perfect. Okay? <laughs> I am not there yet. So he qualifies that. Well, that yes, we can go back and forth with qualifying, but you know, you know, there's there's a thing where the ultimate tolerance of cognitive dissonance of the enlightened mind is actually inexpressible, and it's totally simultaneous. It doesn't really go back and forth. Yeah, right. Somehow. Yeah. yeah. And then, unfortunately, I don't really know how. But <laughs> I can, I, when I you find out, you're gonna let us know. No, I won't. No, I won't. <laughs> <You win>. will <laughs> know. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much, Bob. This has been so you, much fun, and thank I'm you, Raghu. I'm looking forward. You have a great to it. smile. You wait. You just came back from Hawaii or something? No, no, I haven't been anywhere. I've been. I was in India a few months ago. I'm oh, actually, well, yeah. nice and warm. Yes. I, I was just in Laos. Yes, and that's right. Thailand, oh. but I did, didn't get to India. I wish I was. His whole the Dalai Lama did some great things in Bodh Gaya and Sarnath, which I really wish I'd been at. But yeah. I had to do some work. I took a group. You know, trying to raise money and fund Tibet House. Right. Yes, it is yes. so hard oh. to fund Tibet. Oh, so, that brings me. Are we off the air now? No, we we're still on the air. Oh, and you okay. should say that if anybody out there wants to support Tibet House, what do oh, they do? Oh, yes. Tibet House, we so much need it. Uh, you know, because, you know, China is so huge. Everybody's so scared. Oh, I want to make money in China. Oh, I'm scared of China. Oh, China, China. And, you know, even the, you know, the people, governments are afraid to give the Dalai Lama a visa. They're so aggressive, the Chinese, still yeah. in their attempt to ethnocide, ethnocide the Tibetans, you yeah. know, to, make, to put them in a blender of torture camps and things and make them into Chinese. So they yeah. won't even think they ever were Tibetans, which is impossible, you know. Mm. So therefore, it's just very much, it's very horrendous, actually. But anyway, so it's very hard to, for people to sort of wake up and think that it isn't a lost cause and the Tibetans' hearts are still beating and they're still suffering. And they have a wonderful special thing for the world, which is that they're trying to get free from their suffering, even when they don't even necessarily need political freedom. They just need to be free on the ground, locally autonomous, free from their suffering to have their dharma and have their getting real uh, traditions and educations and so forth. And uh, that, 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 that tr they're doing it nonviolently. So we're so worried about some people who do something violent. 
and then oh we've armed them or don't arm them or the you know uh, you know although it's good we defend the weaker people always if the underdogs I think that's good but uh, but uh, we just ignore someone we think if they're not violent they must not care or they're not there or something because we're too steeped in thinking that if somebody really wants them they're ready to be violent and uh, Tibetans have been engaged in a 60-year war, the majority, vast majority, nonviolently to get their life back from this invasion and occupation and sort of colonialist kind of behavior on the part of the Chinese imperium, forget communism, imperium. And, uh, and uh, uh, so it's very hard. So, yeah. And art is even hard because it's culture. We're trying to help and save the culture. Oh, yeah. We're not necessarily feeding people. We're not necessarily fighting in the Congress and lobbying and doing political activism. We're, we, I, we personally do that, but in the, as an institution, we're preserving the culture. So where do people go, Bob, to, to Tibethouse.us, www.tibethouse.us is a website, and uh, www.menla.us also there is, or org, I think will flip over to US, I think, nowadays. And they can be members. You know, it's very easy to be a member. You get a newsletter. You find out a lot about the stuff. And uh, it's not expensive. And uh, that would be great. Yeah, you know? and any help, everybody out there who, I mean, we uh, have so many of our friends and teachers who come from this tradition. And, uh, and, and Bob has been working at this for almost his entire life. And I, I, I advise you all uh, highly. This is a great thing to support. So again, thank you, thank you, thank you. So thank we, have you. A we have a big gala concert on 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 March third at the full moon of the miracle full moon. It's called of the lunar new year. And um, so, people in New York, please come there, or in New Jersey, or in Connecticut. Right, and you come can find all of. You just go to the oh. website tibethouse yes. uh, dot com, and you will. Uh, yes. You will thank find you. Every, everything about it. Bob, again, thank you so much. Thank you, Raghu. And we will see you next time. This is Mind yes, Rolling. Okay. On Can be I still speak to you for a second? After yeah, yeah. Here? Of course. So this uh, is Mind Rolling on the Be Here Now Network, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.